Good morning. Um, we are moving on to chapter 33. Uh, we just finished up earlier, you know, the previous, um, our previous uh, class. We had looked at chapter 32, um, a new day, a new chapter. And uh, chapter 32, we had introduced uh, light, geometric uh, properties of light, and we had used those to uh, take a look at reflection, mirrors, refraction, and single refractive surfaces. Now we're ready to move on and look at lenses. And lenses are just, let's face it, lenses are amazing devices. Uh, if you're like me and you've been wearing corrective lenses since second grade, uh, then you realize how amazing it is to be able to see things in focus. And such a simple device, right? Just some pieces of glass are, that are, are uh, ground to a certain shape. Uh, and you can, you know, correct vision. So anyway, let's get started with this. Of course, there's a bunch of topics. We do have a, a fair amount of stuff to get through in this chapter, so let's get a start. So uh, we're going to be looking at what are called thin lenses. Now, when you look at a thin, <laughs> it looks so thin, if you look at a thin lens, lenses are, um, well, the, we have two refractive surfaces. So there's a refraction that takes place at one surface, it's a refraction at the other, but the two surfaces are close enough, we can treat the two refractions as if they overlap. So it's kind of like, what's the combined refraction of this surface and this surface as if they're both happening in the same plane? So the formulas we work from have a little bit of an approximation to them, but they work pretty well. So we're going to be able to make some uh, good, reliable uh, calculations and, and, again, some more drawings. Now, what happens with lenses is that we can kind of divide them into two categories, same way we did mirrors. So we're going to keep saying, this is just like what we saw with mirrors. That statement is going to happen over and over. So with lenses, we can create lenses that are converging. Lenses that take light in and redirect the light. Now, a converging lens doesn't necessarily bring the light together to a, a, an image. It could be that the lens isn't quite converging enough. So for a converging lens to be converging, uh, let's see what we have to shape it like. Uh, if it's a material, that's a higher index than the surrounding material. So the assumption typically is that the lens is going to be made out of something like glass. It's going to be placed in something like air. And that means that the glass has the higher index of refraction. When we analyze the uh, refractions then, what we find is if the lens is thicker in the middle and narrower around the edges, the overall effect will be converging. Now the glass could look like this, could be one of the surfaces is flat, it could be one surface is convex and one surface is concave. The curvature on that front surface is a, it's a tighter curvature than the one on the back. That means that the curvature on the front dominates. So the one that has the shorter radius of curvature means that the refraction on the front dominates. That's going to be a converging refraction. So yeah, all three of these are going to be uh, converging pieces of glass. Similarly, over here, we could have double concave, uh, concave planar, uh, or concave, where the center is uh, thinner, uh, and that those all those will be diverging. So you know, I, again, I've worn corrective lenses since like second grade or something. And at first, back when I was a kid, uh, I had those diverging lenses because I was nearsighted, and uh, so my glasses looked like this. They were thinner in the middle and they were thicker around the edges. And then more recently, over the past um, ten years or so. Uh, that vision actually got corrected, but uh, now I'm, I'm, you know, it's the short distance items. So now I'm far sighted, and uh, if I'm looking at things up close, I have to. So the glasses I carry around with me now uh, are thicker in the middle and thinner around the edges. So if you wear corrective lenses, that's kind of an advantage in this chapter because you get to take off your corrective lenses and look at them and go, oh, yeah, that's right, that's what my corrective lenses look like. So anyway, converging, diverging lenses, we're going to have both types. Same as before. 
And uh, as you imagine, the definitions are kind of the same. If I bring parallel light in through a converging lens, then the light is going to converge to what we call a focal point. We're going to define this as the focal length. Now notice what's different with a lens compared with a mirror is that if this was a converging mirror, the light would have come in but reflected. So this part of the diagram would have been folded over to the other side. That's the only difference. You can go back and do all the stuff we did with mirrors. Just take the stuff on the, um, yeah, maybe that's, that's difficult, huh? Unfold the mirror diagrams and they become lens diagrams. And this is why I always tell students, if you're having trouble with mirrors, uh, maybe start looking at some problems in the lens chapter and then go back and revisit mirrors afterwards. Lenses are a, a cleaner way to, to learn about optics. And the reason why is, if it's a lens, the object light is on one side coming in and the image light is on the other side going out. So the, uh, the light coming in and the light that's going out are separated, so they, they don't, it's not as confusing. The diagrams are going to be simpler than they were. And, that, and again, if, if chapter 31 with the mirrors was a little murky, uh, see how this uh, lens stuff goes. So uh, go ahead and get a start on these, and then go back and revisit chapter 31. So this is an example of a converging lens. Now, if the light's coming in, from a different direction, what that says is it's going to focus in the same plane, so this is now defining, uh, defining a focal plane that we're going to end up with. But that's, you know, some diagrams for uh, showing a converging lens. Similarly, here's a diverging lens, so light's coming in parallel. It's diverging, I refract here, I refract here, and at the end of those two refractions, the light is spreading out there is not going to be a real focal point. There is going to be a virtual focal point, and that virtual focal point is going to be back here. All right, same as what we saw with mirrors, except, except this is easier, right? Because, again, here is the object light coming in, and then the image light continues right through to the other side, so that the image light and the object light are on opposite sides of the lens, and... Um, I think it's easier. I think it, it really makes lenses easier to think about. Uh, ooh, this is a familiar formula. So this is a formula we used for lenses, and it works for, for mirrors, and it's going to work for lenses. So it's going to work the very same way. Uh, we're going to extend this and say that 1 over the focal length is defined as the lens power. Now, it's, it's not the same thing as watts. It's not the same thing as mechanical power, but it is referred to as lens power. Now, this is what gets measured in diopters. And if, again, if you wear corrective lenses, then you know about diopters. You know, going to the optometrist and you get a prescription, and the prescription is listed in diopters. So optometrists don't give you the prescription in focal lengths, which they could. Instead, they work in terms of the inverse. And, and I think one of the reasons for that is... Uh, the, the shorter the focal length is, the more powerful the lens. And so by using the inverse, uh, lower values of diopters are lower prescriptions. Higher values of diopters represent shorter focal lengths, and those are stronger lenses. They're more powerful. All right, we're doing lens ray tracing again, so uh, here we go. Uh, here is an object, okay, and again, these are, these are so much easier to think about, I think, than mirrors. So here is an object. For me, it's a triangle. I'm imagining a triangle there. Here's an object. Here's path number one that comes in parallel, and then it crosses through the focal point. Now, with lenses, uh, for thin lenses, it actually turns out it doesn't matter which order the refractions take place. I got a refraction here and a refraction here. If I take a thin lens and flip it around, it works the same way. And, and actually, I remember that as a kid. One of the things I first discovered with my new glasses back in second or third grade was I could put my glasses on front ways and then I could reverse them and they still worked the very same way, or more or less, pretty similarly. And so thin lenses can be reversed and we still have the same focal length. 
That means that we actually have a focal length on either side. When we do the ray diagrams, we can come in parallel and then continue through to the focal length on the other side. That's line number one. Line number two would be to go through the focal point on the object side, where the object light is, and then when we hit the uh, lens, we're going to head parallel. So once I've drawn those two paths, same as before, I have identified the location of the image. And with lenses, the image light is on this side, and that means a real image will be on the side where the light actually is. That's a real image. So I got uh, that diagram we have right there is for a real object forming a real image. Now the third line, we don't, there's not a center of curvature for the lens that we work from. Instead, what we can work from with lenses is if I work right at something that goes through the center of the lens, we can say in the limit where the lens is really thin, uh, we can treat that as if it goes straight through. And so that, that works well. Uh, so the third line, and maybe this is my favorite line of all, is the one that goes from the object right through the center of the lens and just goes straight. I only have to put my ruler down once and I can draw the line all the way across. So uh, if we've done everything correctly, those three paths should come to more or less a, a sharp point and that will identify the location of the image. So for this uh, real image that we have, it's inverted. Uh, a couple things to, oh, here's the thing we, I, I talked about before. Uh, when we were looking at mirrors. Uh, the, the slides that come with our textbook, they like to put uh, the person's eye right there. I think I have uh, removed that. I've edited some of these so that they're not there because it always confuses me. But the thing to remember here is uh, the human near point, the closest an object can be where we can still focus, it's about 25 centimeters. If this person's too close to that image, they're not going to be able to focus on it. They need to relax and sit back a little bit uh, to be able to look at the image that's being formed. Now, more often what happens is uh, a lens like this might be used to create an image on a screen. So wherever the image, wherever a real image is located, we could put a screen right there. I could put a screen there and then I could stand over on the other side of the screen and I could look at the screen and see the image. Kind of like in a movie theater, right? You're sending the light through a lens out onto the screen and uh, you're getting a nice sharp image on the screen and people can sit back and watch the image on the screen. Ooh, what happens if I block off half of the lens? Uh, so this is kind of interesting. What would happen, here's a good diagram to work from. What would happen if somehow this part of the lens is blocked. Let's say that we put a barrier right here. Light can't get uh, through this region. How is that going to affect the image? What part of the image will disappear if we block the lower part of the lens? Well, let's see. In terms of my diagram, path one still works. Uh, path two is going to be blocked. So path two is not going to happen. But path three still works. And so what's going to happen is, oh, you know what these diagrams are showing? Every point on the image actually results from light passing through every part of the lens. So if I block off, how many paths are there leading from this object point to this image point? And you go, there's like an infinite number. If I block off half the lens, I will take away half of those paths and the image will get dimmer, but no part of the image will disappear. All of the image will still be present if we block off half of the lens. Now, what would happen if we blocked off the center region, but we left the surrounding regions? Same thing. Uh, what that would do is it would remove some of the paths, but every part of the image would still form. As long as we've got some part of the lens where light's still passing through, we'll get a full image uh, formed from that. All right, here is a diverging lens. So with the diverging lens, let's try that. Here is my real object, 
out here. I'll take path number one. Let's see, path number one went parallel. Now this is a diverging lens. So I'm not going to turn and converge towards this focal point. I am going to diverge and path number one in the image light is going to be aligned with the focal point on the other side. Okay, remember we got a focal point on each side. When we're doing the ray diagrams, we use each of those focal points once. So um, that's going to send the light off in that direction. Then if we take what I think of as, as the easiest path, well, let's go ahead and do path two. Uh, we'll do them in, in numerical order. So the other path, we've used this focal point. So the next path to use would be to use the focal point on the other side. Now this was parallel in, focal point out. So this has to be focal point in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a path that lines up with the focal point. When I get to the plane of the lens, notice it's that plane that we're working from, then I go parallel. So that's path number two. When I look at path number two and path number one, I see that the light's spreading out. It's not a big deal. It's not a surprise because it's a divergent lens, right? If it's a divergent lens, then we're expecting the path one and path two. We're going to spread out here on the other side. So to find out where the image is, we're going to trace these back. And where they trace back to and cross is right here. So that's the location of the image. Now, there's a third path, and we said this was the easiest of all. We should have started with this one. This one goes right through the center and continues on to the other side. So path number one, two, and three for the object light. Path one, two, and three for the image light. The object light is spreading away from a real object, but the image light is spreading away from a virtual image. Questions on that? Okay, so we've got these uh, converging and diverging lenses. We've got these real and virtual images. Um, <clears throat> So we've talked about all this. I guess this is just kind of a, um, a review of what we've already looked at. And that is, I've got this real object. I've got this real image. As an example, this is a converging lens. Uh, the light on this side, I can think of as the light associated with my object. The light on this side, these lines, are going to converge on the location of my image. Uh, I have my DOs and my DIs identified. There is a focal point on either side. Uh, this particular image is real and inverted. Uh, and the sign conventions are, for focal length, if it's converging, it's positive. If it's diverging, it's negative. Uh, for the, oh, that's supposed to say object and image distance. Those got left out. So this should be DO and DI. And positive indicates that they're real, and negative indicates virtual. Same as we defined with mirrors. So that's a good reference slide to come back to. And then I guess the other thing to keep track of here is, here is my HO, there is my HI. Uh, and we've got to look at some magnifications too, right? We haven't uh, defined the magnifications yet. Here's a reminder of what all those sign conventions are. Here we go. Here's the magnification formula. Same as before. HI over HO. We still have a set of uh, similar triangles. So let's go back and pick those up. Let's see, where are my similar triangles? Right here. So if I look at triangle A, O, O prime, this triangle right there, that is similar. They're both right, right triangles and they have the same angle here. That's a similar triangle to A, I, I prime. So that says they're similar triangles and that means that I can take ratios of matching sides. HO is to H, HI is to HO as DI is to DO. And then we have to put that minus sign in because of the way um, 
the signs are defined. So they're similar triangles, but if DI and DO are positive, then HO and HI will have opposite signs. So again, we, we, we looked at this with mirrors, but as I keep repeating, I think everything's easier with lenses, so it's worth slowing down and kind of rethinking about all these things with lenses, and then go back and, and think, oh yeah, and that's why it worked with mirrors also. Okay. Um, and then the power, we, we mentioned this earlier, that the power of the lens in diopters is um, calculated as 1 over f. Okay, here are the ray diagrams. So, here's all the recommendations again. Draw your diagrams carefully. Go back and forth. Draw the diagram. Uh, bring out your formulas. Try working from the formulas. Go back and forth as needed. Uh, keep working back and forth until they make sense. Until the formulas and the numbers you're calculating match up with what you're drawing on the diagrams. Okay, and, and then, you know, think about what you're doing as you uh, draw those diagrams and as you uh, do those calculations. Now, this one, I, let's see, uh, there's a leaf. And we're trying to take a picture of that leaf. So it says, is that what it is? Oh, it is, it's a camera lens. So this is a single uh, refracting lens camera. It's an SRL camera. We're just working from uh, a single converging lens. Is that right? Is that what they call them? SLRs? Anyway, we have a single lens camera and uh, this looks like the object point O prime and we're just drawing lines like before. It's just that it's a little bit extreme. So I would say, I, I wouldn't draw this diagram this way. What I would do is uh, I would rescale the vertical axis so that the vertical axis is bigger. Uh, because if I, if I keep these vertical distances really small like this, there's a larger chance that my diagrams will, will be more confusing than they are useful. So uh, again, what I would do is maybe not make the horizontal axis quite so big, uh, maybe scale things down and then maybe scale things up so that it's easier to keep track of all the paths. But it's basically the same thing we've looked at before. Now, as far as the numbers, this is, oh, look, I'm bringing back this diagram that we introduced back in chapter 31. If you remember, uh, for a converging mirror or lens, I'm going to say a converging lens now, uh, there, this diagram, there's a couple of hyperbolas. This axis is keeping track of DO. This uh, axis is keeping track of the image distance. And uh, this is the real-to-real -real quadrant. This is real-to-virtual. And the numbers we have on this example, it's a camera. The DO is 100 centimeters. So the, the uh, object, that I, it's only 100 centimeters, huh? Is that right? Yeah, one meter. That's only a one meter distance. Okay. So it's a hundred centimeters for DO. The focal length is 5.00 centimeters. So the DO is quite a bit larger than the focal length. And that means where I am on this graph, uh, this would be DO equals the focal length right at this asymptote. So I got to come away two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So it's way out here at DO is equal to 20 focal lengths. And so we're way out here somewhere with the camera. And uh, the DO is uh, 100 centimeters. And that says the DI is going to be really close to a focal length. It's going to be just barely outside the focal length, right? Outside the focal point. So let's see what that works like. The focal length is given at 5 centimeters when I put my numbers in. Yeah, so the image is coming in, uh, the image distance is just beyond that focal point. It's at 5.26 centimeters. Now that's how cameras are designed. Cameras are designed so that we can make use of this part of the graph. We want to create a real image 
uh, cameras can't take pictures of virtual images because they're not there. And so we need to work from a real object forming a real image and by using this part of the solutions I can look at a wide range of DOs. The camera is designed so it can take a picture of something close in and it can take a picture of something way, 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 way out there. And if I work in this part of the graph, then just with moving my lens back and forth a little bit, I can focus on a wide range of DOs. So I've got this wide range of DO values and DI varies only a little bit. And that's what you want for the camera. You don't want a camera where the lens has to move back and forth several meters. That's not very practical. All right. Um, but that's the number we're getting. And then in terms of the, ma uh, the magnification, what we're getting is um, minus, it's inverted, uh, 0 0.0526. Now, of course, if cameras are using just a single converging lens, what's going to happen is the image that forms on the uh, screen in the camera, so inside the camera, the screen consists of a bunch of sensors. But the image that forms inside the camera is inverted. So you guys have probably noticed that, right? When you take photos and you look at them, they're inverted. No. So how would you know if they're inverted? So the image that actually forms inside the camera is inverted, but you just re, you know, if you're taking photos on film, you just take the photo and you flip it around. If you're taking photos digitally, then you just, you rotate the photo, right? Once you get the image, you just rotate it, or it's been pre-rotated when you look at the photos that you've taken. So yeah, the image actually is inverted for that. What about human vision? And again, see, I'm, I'm crossing out this. I think that's just, for me, that's confusing. Uh, and again, the, you can't focus on something closer than 25 centimeters. So the image that this person is trying to focus on would need to be um, 25 centimeters away. So maybe it works, depending on the numbers here. Uh, this says we are looking at an object uh, we're using a converging lens, and we're using it very close. The object is here inside the focal point. And so here is the... I'm going to ignore that person for a minute and just ask, where is the image going to be located? So my diagram says that if I go in uh, parallel, then I'm going to converge through this focal point. But when I take this focal point, I actually can't send the light through it because I'm already closer than the focal point. So we saw this example with, the, uh, with mirrors. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up that focal point and extend a line to the center plane of my lens and then take it out parallel from there. When I, and then I can take a third line right through the center. When I bring these three lines back to see where they originate from, that's the location of the virtual image. So this is... It's actually a magnifier. So if I have a magnifying glass, or just a, a magnifier is what we call them, uh, I can take that magnifying glass, bring it very close to my eye, and then I can look at something, and it looks bigger. So let's take a look and see what the numbers, how the numbers work out. On this one, it said the focal length is 15, but the, the object we're looking at, I've got my magnifier out, I've got my uh, object, and I'm bringing it in really close inside the focal length. So the object is actually only 10 centimeters away, and it says that uh, the image then is going to show up at minus 30. That's good news. I can't focus on something closer to me than 25, but this image is 30 centimeters away. So even though the object is only 10 centimeters away, its image is 30 centimeters away, and the light that's actually reaching my eye, oh yeah, maybe I do need that picture. The light that actually reaches my eye is patterned based on the location of the image, not the object. So if I look at paths one, two, three here, that's my image light. And so yeah, I, I can focus on that uh, image. So I can hold up the magnifier, 
and that lets me bring an object much closer than I would be able to otherwise and I can actually see a lot more detail that way and that's what allows us to use uh, a single converging lens as a magnifier. Okay, on this one, what else did we need to show? There's a location of the image. Here is the magnification. It's right side up, right? So in this case, the image that I see on a magnifier is right side up. On my graph, what we've done is we've taken the object, the DO value is going to be within the focal length. So I'm actually in the range of real object forming virtual image. That's a virtual image. The light's not really coming from that location. All right. I hope this is all falling into place. Um, I think lenses and mirrors are, are difficult. So uh, you certainly, I'm, I'm totally uh, sympathetic um, if you're saying this is going to take a while, it's going to take a few passes through to have this make sense. Here's another example. I have a diverging lens. Oh, it's a diverging lens. And it says we're going to take a small insect. Um, it says 25 centimeter diverging lens, but we know if it's diverging, that needs to be negative 25. And what we want to do is form a virtual image. Ooh, let's see, what, see if we can make these numbers work. Uh, again, I'm not entirely seeing what they're seeing. Okay, I, I listed all the information. That's always a good idea, right? So I've just listed all the information. Uh, the focal length is minus 25 because it's diverging. And uh, the image location, now this is interesting because instead of starting with the object, we're going to start with the image. Is that going to work? And the answer is, well, of course, because anything we do from object to image can be reversed. We could treat the image as the object and work back through the problem. Images and objects can always be uh, reversed with respect to each other. So, uh, let's see. <laughs> that said, how, how the heck are we going to do this? So, um, I'm trying to think of how I... I would like to say I drew the diagram first, but I'm guessing that what I did instead was I did the math first, put all these numbers in, made sure I had the correct signs here. They said this is going to be a virtual image. What I found from that was I needed a DO of 100 centimeters, and the magnification I'm predicting is no inversion, but uh, the magnification is going to be one-fifth. So given all the numbers from the math, what would the diagram look like? And if I choose to bring in these little graphs that I've been using to uh, identify which quadrant we're looking at. Uh, so here's my graph. What I did is I took the focal points. Now those were minus 25, but remember for the lenses, I've got a focal point on both sides. So I draw a focal length out here, focal length out here. I'm ready to use both. But I have to remember it's diverging. So that means that uh, if I come out two, three, four, I guess that scales. 25 centimeters, 50, 75, 100. Here is my object. And notice how I made it big enough so that I can actually, when I start drawing these lines at different angles, it's more meaningful. It's easier to do the diagrams this way. So don't get yourself caught drawing these little uh, images that are like, or object heights that are little tiny things. If I draw it this tall, there's no way I'm going to see the detail of what's going on. Okay, so use a different scaling as needed. So I'm using a really big scale here for my HO. And uh, I'm coming in parallel, path number one, and it's a diverging lens. So, so path number one on the way out is going to be directed away from the focal point. Focal point's right here. Path number two is going to... Oh. Okay, for whatever reason, path number two, this is not the the numbering they've been using. But for path number two, I went right through the center. And I, I have to tell you, I, I'm, that's usually the first path I draw is the one through the center. Uh, that's a pretty reliable path. So I've got a path through the center. And by the time I've done path one and two, I can see they cross each other right here. Now, I could draw a third path. A third path would, let's see, I've used 
the focal point on this side. I've used the center. Oh, I have the focal point on the other side. So let's get the ruler out, draw a line that lines up with that focal point. Oh, I didn't draw the dash lines. Dash line here, dash line here, dash line here. Okay, sorry about that. Got to get those dash lines in. And since it's a diverging lens, something that's coming in as if it's converging, a diverging lens is going to send that out parallel. So that's paths one, two, and three. And the good side of this is that um, the upside is that they all lined up. And they all agree that the image is right there, using all those together. So <clears throat> let's check and see. The DO came in at 100 plus. The DI came in at minus 20. Yeah, that seems just fine. And then on the diagram, because it's a diverging lens, the asymptotes are going to be in the negative region. So the, the vertical asymptote is here, and the horizontal asymptote is at negative uh, 25 centimeters. It's at the focal length. And so there is no solution real to real. What we're looking at is real image forms, uh, sorry, real object forms virtual image. And um, the DO is at 100, which is a pretty big number, and the DI is at negative 20, which is not so big. Uh, so the solution is right there along that uh, hyperbola. Okay. Uh, what about multiple lenses? What if I have more than one lens? Uh, so here is lens A, here is lens B. They each have their own focal point. Uh, there's a diagram down there saying here is object light one. Here's the object light coming into lens number one. And here is the image light coming out. Wait a minute, the pattern of image light coming out is the object light for lens two. And then finally, we'll have some image light for lens two. And we can, they've given us all the numbers here. They've given us both focal lengths. They gave us a starting. So, so let's do this. Two lenses. I'm going to do one lens at a time. So lens number one, focal length of 20 centimeters. DO is equal to 60. This was all given. I'm solving for DI. That's plus 30. That's real. And it's inverted. Uh, the magnification here is minus 0.50. That was everything for lens one. Now what we can do is we can pick up the, um, let's see, the location uh, from the first lens and use that to come up with an object distance for the second lens. Now I can't just take that number 30. Let's go back and see what the whole diagram is going to look like. So what we've shown is that there's an image formed here. Now, the distance between the lenses is 80 centimeters, and so this total distance here is 80. This worked out to be, what was it, 30? So I still have 50 centimeters left. That's going to be my DO. Yeah. So I took the distance between the lenses, subtracted off this 30 centimeters, so this is also where you want to draw the diagrams, right? Because you got to know, do I have to add the 30 centimeters? Do I subtract the 30 centimeters? It's going to be easier to see if you've drawn the diagram. And if you're familiar enough with the diagrams, that they make sense. So uh, again, learn to use the diagrams. The diagrams are going to be really handy. And, they're, and bottom line, they're going to be required on the, the midterms. Okay, so on the exams, you're going to see... Questions that say, draw the diagram, show what the uh, ray diagram looks like. So that's my DO. I have the focal length. Again, I can go in and solve for the image, and then I can show the uh, magnification. Now, that's told me where everything is located. This is going to be real and inverted. This one was real and inverted. The net magnification is going to come from the product. So sometimes, you know, students add the magnifications together. But magnifications are something that are multiplied. So if I have an object and the magnification is 5, well, the image is 5 times bigger. But if the next magnification is 2, then something that was already 5 times bigger is going to be 2 times as big. That's going to make 10. So magnifications are always going to get multiplied together. And I think you can take the numbers we ended up with and go back to this diagram and 
go back and forth and um, see how that has worked. Now, here's another one of those geometric pictures that we're not going to go in and derive. Uh, if you want to stop the office hours and, and if you want to try working through some of these, we can. Um, but what this is, is it's the lens maker's equation. We just want to put it out there. You're welcome to use this. This can go into your notes, your one page of notes. And what it says is that the focal length on a lens is based on its index of refraction times 1 over the 2 radiuses of curvature where the conventional diagram is this. A positive value of R1 is on this side. So here's R1 for the front surface. And a positive value for R2 is a, a convex surface. So the, the positive values are if the surfaces are convex. They go negative if they're concave. And then I have to know the index of refraction. And this is assuming that the glass has an index of N, and the surrounding index is air. If you put a lens in water, it no longer is going to have the same focal length as the lens operating in air. The, the refractions won't work the same way. So here's an example of using the lens maker equation. Let's say that we have... Uh, so this is, this is a, a typical shape for like corrective lenses for... Uh, for farsightedness, and uh, if R1 is 22.4 centimeters and R, R1 is, and then R2 is minus 46.2, so this is convex, it's getting the minus sign, this is concave, it's, sorry, this is convex, it's getting the plus sign, this is concave, this is getting the minus sign, and the radius of curvature here is longer. We just plug the numbers in, and what we can say is that R1 is converging, R2 is diverging, but R1 is more converging than R2 is diverging. Uh, R1 has a tighter curvature to it. Sure enough, when we put the numbers in, we find out that the focal length for this lens is 87 centimeters. How do we turn that into some number of diopters? It's a two-step process. The first thing we have to do is rewrite the focal length in meters, and that's what we did here. So the power is going to be 1 over the focal length, but that focal length needs to be in meters. Diopters are inverse meters. They're not inverse centimeters. They're not inverse millimeters. So again, first step is to get the focal length in standard units of meters and then invert it. Uh, okay, and then they say... I'm, I'm, what did they ask about the 200? Uh, where will the image be for an object? Yeah, so if we have an... Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, for an object that's two meters away, uh, the image is... i got to go back and double-check that number. The image is at 154... Oh, the, the focal length is positive, and we're out... Okay, so this is a tight... This, yeah, this, this is a pretty short focal length. Anyway, yeah, that, that, everything looks fine. Okay, camera. We had started talking about cameras a little bit, so let's follow up with that. We can uh, view the camera as having a single uh, refractive or, or a converging lens. So a single converging lens. Uh, here is the aperture that determines how much light. If we need more light, we have to open the aperture more but that opens up also the possibility, if there are imperfections in the lens, that the image won't be as sharp. It's harder to make an image sharp if we're using a broad sample of light. And then at the back of camera, we have the sensors that are going to pick up the information. So here's an example. You know, this is showing here is a sensor, here are electrodes coming away from all these different pixels. Uh, and then it's showing that a color pixel has to be ready to uh, sample red, green, and blue light coming in in order to produce a color photo. All right. Um, I think we're good on this. Uh, I think we've looked at some of this example before. Okay, here's actually something numerical. Um, so let's take a look and see. So what it's saying is this. It's saying that we have a camera that is, foc is able to focus 
all the way out to light coming in off of an object at infinity. So I can be taking photos far, far away. Those, those scenes of the horizon out there, or I can get it out at night and take pictures of the sky. Something really, really far away is in focus. Now what it says, using our standard set of formulas, so using our standard set of formulas, uh, if DO is equal to zero, then the focal length is just equal to DI. So that says that DI, for, for DO equals infinity, needs to be five centimeters. Uh, uh, and that's based on the focal length. So the lens and the sensors need to have a five centimeter spacing between them. Now what happens if I want to take a close-up of something? What happens if I want to bring something in? Well, this is still three meters away. That's not so close. So three meters away, you know, it's just across the room. Uh, that's 300 centimeters. Now when I go through and solve for DI, the DI is going to be 5.085. Uh, that's not such a big difference. So uh, what that's saying is I have to change the distance between the sensors and the lens. Uh, the lens is going to need to move out a little bit in order to take uh, close-ups. If we moved in even closer, so I'm, I'm guessing my camera should actually take pictures as close as, um, I don't know, 20 or 30 centimeters out. For those, this is going to have to move quite a bit farther. But the bottom line is, for just moving the lens back and forth a little bit, we can really get a wide range of object distances. And that means I can have a camera that can take pictures far, far away, and it can take pictures of objects that are close by. Moving on to human vision. Now, human vision works a little differently. Uh, we have, uh, as far as the lensing system, most of the refraction is a single refractive effect. If you think back to the end of chapter... Uh, 32, a single refractive surface, and that is the cornea at the front of the eye. That is where most of the refraction takes place. Now, back behind that is a lens, inside a lens capsule, and the lens is flexible. So instead of having a lens that moves forward and back, like a camera with a fixed lens, uh, the lens is flexible. And with a series of muscles surrounding the lens, the lens can, when the mu muscles contract, it makes the lens bulge. And then when the muscles relax, the lens flattens. And that determines whether things are in focus or not. Now, when you think about it, how did you ever learn to control those muscles? Right? Because, I mean, if I look at an object close by, you know, if, if you're looking at something close by, you can focus on that. And then if suddenly there's a noise off in the distance, you look up, and you went from something nearby in focus to something far away that's still in focus. And that means that your, you know, your muscles around your lens in your eyes were contracting, and then they immediately relaxed. That comes from practice, right? So I always think of, you know, you see little infants that are looking around at everything, and I always wonder, hmm, have they figured out how to control the focusing mechanism yet? Because, uh, you know, you're certainly not aware of it. It just happens very naturally, and you don't really have much control over it. But somehow that gets learned. Uh, you have an automatic focus uh, built into your visual system. So, uh, anyway, this is what's going on with the eye. And, uh, again, we have a lens here with this time we have a lens here with a variable focal length that can do a little bit of fine tuning. Most of the conversion is done with the cornea and the lens then is only needed to do a little bit of fine tuning uh, farther in. Now as you know, a lot of people wear corrective lenses and that happens when uh, the combination of the cornea and the lens and the distances within the eye mean that the lens, the person even though they can contract or relax their lens, uh, they're still not able to bring things into focus. Let's see. So this is working correctly. So here's an object at infinity, and uh, the lens is, the cornea and the lens together are putting everything right in focus. 
But here, an object has been brought in closer, and again, this is the correct uh, operation of the eye. The lens bulges, meaning it's becoming more uh, converging, and that enables it to uh, that enables it to still maintain uh, a good focus on a nearby object. Now the problems come up. Let's um, go back and look at this. How close can we bring that object in and still focus on it? Because there's going to be a limit to how much bulging we can get from our flexible lenses. And uh, it says normal distance, uh, uh, normal near points are considered to be 25 centimeters. In other words, what's considered normal is you should be able to focus on something as close as 25 centimeters away, but they're saying, you know, typical person, once it gets closer than 25, they're not going to be able to focus on it. It's going to go gradually towards a fuzzier and fuzzier image. Okay. Uh, the far point, so that's a near point, and then a far point is, should be at infinity. The idea is you should be able to focus on anything. Now, when people hear infinity, they go, what? I can't see all the way to infinity, can I? Uh, what this is saying is no matter how far away an object is, it should still remain in focus. So you should be able to look at things that are, you know, miles and miles, kilometers and kilometers away, and assuming there's not uh, a lot of disturbance in the atmosphere or whatever, the atmosphere is relatively clear of... Uh, of compounds besides the oxygen, nitrogen, and argon that should be there, uh, then images should still be clear. In fact, if it's a clear evening and the atmosphere isn't too fuzzy, uh, you know, you should be able to look at distant galaxies. You should be able to look at the Andromeda galaxy, which is like two million light years away, and it should be in focus, more or less. That's kind of difficult because of atmospheric effects. Anyway, that's the idea about a far point and a near point. So what this is showing is, hey, if a person is nearsighted, then they're kind of stuck with too much convergence. And if you're looking at something way off in the distance, it, the, the focus is not happening at the retina. Uh, near objects, they're okay, but distant objects, they're not. And that's the most common sort of um, uh, correction that's needed for kids. A lot of kids are nearsighted and they get diverging lenses, see the diverging lens, uh, to help out with that. And then um, farsightedness is kind of the flip side of that. It's that there's not enough convergence. And so when you're looking at something close by, uh, it's not in focus. But at distance, you're okay. Let's see. They never showed that, did they? Nearsighted... Okay, so what we can do is, for a nearsighted person, we can prescribe diverging lenses that will allow them to take the light that's coming in from infinity, the diverging light spreads it out a bit, and then the converging system of the person's eye, the cornea, and the lens over-converge. So the lens has prepared the light, so when the person's eye over-converges, it compensates and the lens compensates for that and, and things are in focus at the back. Uh, same thing with uh, farsightedness. The person's not converging enough. We prescribe them a lens that provides a little more convergence and then they can focus on objects that are close by. Okay, here's an example. Ooh, let's see how we're doing with time. I think it's time for a break. How do you guys feel about that? Uh, definitely. Let's go ahead and uh, take a break. Uh, you guys have questions, let me know.